The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. Municipal governments don't get the coverage that other levels of government do, and we wonder whether that's led to an apparent rise in bad behavior by local politicians. Plus, targeted almost daily by cyber criminals, we'll find out how Ontario municipalities contend with threats coming at them from near and far. It's Monday, April 4th, and that's ahead on The Agenda. Politicians are often painted as craven, self-interested rogues, which is often unfair, but it's more easily believed when some behave in ways not even becoming of high school student government. Allegations of terrible behavior by some municipal politicians in this province over the past few years has put a spotlight on all municipal councils and their codes of conduct. With elections coming in October, let's check in on this with, in the nation's capital, Joanne Chianello, City Affairs Analyst for CBC Ottawa. In Hamilton, Ontario, David Arbuckle. He's Executive Director of the Association of Municipal Managers, Clerks and Treasurers of Ontario. And in Markham, Ontario, John Mascarin, partner at Aird & Burles, who specializes in municipal law. And it's great to have you three on our airwaves tonight. I just want to start by putting a bit of a list out there for those who haven't followed the story as closely as you have, because uh, we're not talking about just a couple of things here. There's a lot going on. So, Sheldon, let's get this list up here and we'll go through a bit of the hits and misses. Name calling on social media. Yeah, we're seeing lots of that, of course. Alleged attacks on personal property. For example, allegations of repeated keying of a councillor's car, harassment of municipal staff, refusal to participate in investigations of said harassment, as is the case of an Ottawa councillor, civil suits against election officials, sexual harassment allegations, council meetings cancelled for weeks due to infighting and municipal staff refusing to attend council meetings because of said infighting. Uh, and the list goes on. Joanne, you've, uh, let's start with you because you've been covering Ottawa City Hall for many years. Is it worse today than it was? Yeah, I think it is uh, in some ways. I mean, those are a lot of different subjects, right? So social media has been worse for all politicians and also members of the public everywhere. So that's its own special category of people behaving badly in public. Um, for councillors, though, I think one of the things that we've seen here is... Uh, people have been there a long time. We have some veteran counselors. And, you know, here, uh, our most infamous case, of course, is Councillor Rick Shirelli, who's been a counselor for almost 30 years, has found just uh, uh, two big reports, damning reports, finding a pattern of harassment and sexual harassment in his office for years and years. It, it was a shocking case. And, yeah, I think people have thought uh, the council behavior is worse now. We'll talk about what consequences are possible and have been laid against Councillor Shirelli and others. We'll get that uh, still to come. But, uh, John, why don't you pick up on that? You've been watching this uh, from your perch in the legal community for many, many years. Is it worse now than it's been? You know, Steve, it, it appears worse because, of course, it's magnified now uh, because now you have to have codes of conduct in every municipality. And so you see these coming forward much more. I, I differ from Joanne. I think this has always been the case. I think councillor members have always been behaving badly throughout the years. And it is more recently that a spotlight's been focused primarily through the accountability and transparency mechanisms put in place by the Municipal Act. So I I believe uh, you've seen really atrocious behavior now brought to the spotlight when it didn't used to be before. Well, let's, I guess, remember the Ontario Municipal Board was created about a century ago because there was so much uh, <laughs> malfeasance and corruption on local councils all across Ontario. So, right, there's nothing necessarily new in this, but, uh, okay, David, why don't you come in here and tell us uh, from your vantage point, does it feel worse today than it's been? Yeah, and uh, yeah, I think it's important to remember too, Steve, that there are thousands of municipal councillors throughout uh, throughout Ontario alone, and just uh, a lot of very well-meaning uh, people in it for the right reasons. But the reality is, and, and we're hearing from a number of our members, uh, you know, that are primarily uh, municipal or, or exclusively municipal staff, that the environment is not a good one right now. That that there is there are constant opportunities for, especially public opportunities where there are counselors who feel that they are 
you know, the members of the opposition and it is ultimately their job to challenge and uh, to influence staff in their decision making. So, yeah, it's certainly the, the feeling that we're getting from staff is that the relationship between both council and staff is one that's uh, degenerating a bit within the province. Let me share some numbers with you and, uh, by extension, with our viewers and listeners. This is from an Ontario Municipal Administrators Association poll. And they discovered, after surveying members, that 77% reported harassment and bullying by elected officials on the non-elected staff. 76% stated being personally harassed by a member of council. Uh, okay, David, come back in here. What do you make of those numbers? Yeah, this is certainly, those are certainly numbers, Steve, that are, are being reflected by our members. I've been with AMPTO for just over a year now, and I've had probably about a dozen emails from, from uh, our members that are echoing those numbers uh, as well. And uh, the key piece is we even have some members, uh, I've had probably about six members who have told us they're leaving the sector entirely as it relates to the relationship that they're, uh, or the experiences that they're having at a local level. So certainly, yeah, certainly our members are reflecting those numbers um, uh, on, you know, again, a weekly and monthly basis. John, how do you react to those numbers? Those numbers are uh, egregiously bad, aren't they? Um, and I, I have been hearing those things for many years now. I've been an integrity commissioner for about uh, close to 10 years, I think. Um, and it's something that I have been aware of. And the, the reputational damage to municipalities, uh, you, can't, you can't undo that uh, when, you, when you hear these things. Um, and it is a real concern. Joanne, when you watch Ottawa City Council meetings, and admittedly, a lot of it's been online over the last couple of years as opposed to in person, so that may exer exacerbate some of these difficulties, but do, do you routinely notice elected officials picking on staff members, as this poll suggests? You know, I, there are, it's a really fine line, right? Because, of course, council should be able to uh, question uh, the decisions of staff, the... the, the you know, why they're making certain calls. Uh, they should be able to disagree with staff, right? I don't necessarily see them picking on them. Uh, there have been a few incidents, for example, our previous uh, general manager of transit, you know, we've had a big LRT issue here. There have been councillors who've asked him to, to call him for account, and on occasion, the mayor has demanded an apology. And I'm not sure that it, that, that counts as harassment. It, it's a really hard question, right? But for sure, there are lots of other incidents where you have heard, count, you know, counselors say, I'm a counselor, I can do what I want. Um, I can make or break your career here. And of course, that's harassment. And I actually go back to John's point where I think politicians, not all of them, of course, um, have often treated staff poorly. Uh, but we haven't seen that. And there haven't been these vehicles for staff to uh, complain about that before. Well, David, just for argument's sake, let me make the flip side of the argument, if I can. Politicians, theoretically, are accountable in a way that staff are not, right? Staff don't have to go up to the electorate every four years and get their jobs renewed. Politicians do. Is there an argument to be made that, that as a result of that added accountability, uh, you know, the buck stops with the politicians and the staff should just toughen up if politicians are asking tough questions? Yeah, I, th I think part of the challenge here, Steve, is that there's a, a general misunderstanding sometimes of, of counselors in uh, understanding the role of staff and the traditional role of staff. Staff has an obligation and sometimes uh, even a professional um, um, uh, mandate to bring forward policy advice that is you know, neutral and um, unpartisan and is in the best interest in relation to their, their own profession. So a lot of times there is... Um, you know, uh, counselors that don't necessarily understand that, and they're taking it uh, as a you know a personal affront to uh, their responsibilities uh, as a counselor. And the other piece to remember too is a, a number of times, and counselors often forget that is that they're not the ones responsible for directing staff. Staff is accountable to council as a as a whole, and ultimately they're bringing advice uh, to that council uh, as a whole. In order to get some some uh, some direction, so I think I think really the problem lies, again from a staff perspective, is a, really a lack of understanding on the council uh, uh, from a council perspective 
that uh, it really is um, it really is the staff's responsibility to bring that advice forward, uh, regardless of sort of the political intentions of the individual councillors. All right, Joanne. But if help I us. could jump in, yeah, yeah please I do. I wanted to jump in there. I mean, but council are the people; uh, they are the elected officials, and they wear all the decisions of council. So I can understand that they want to know exactly why decisions are being made. They want to know why policies are being made. They're the ones that say yes or no. Uh, we have this great system here, uh, a situation here where a uh, LRT uh, billion dollar, you know, a, a multi billion dollar uh, decision was made by council. It turns out that there was weirdness about the procurement, right? That one that the proponent hadn't actually uh, uh, met the minimum test score, right? And so I don't want to get into the details here, but council's wearing that decision, not the staff, not the people behind the scenes who made that. And so I understand why they want to know what those decisions are, why they disagree with that. Um, and it's it's a hard position that they're in because they're also, uh, as David says, they're not experts in these matters. So they are counting on staff to bring them their best experts and they have to take it on face value. And when they don't agree, it can seem uh, tense. It can seem egregious. But, you know, there's a line. How do you disagree with that uh, in a respectful way as opposed to harass people, call them names? call them out on, on social media. And that's, I think, what's been changing. And I'm not sure, also, John and, and David would know more because I watch Ottawa. Is it different in smaller municipalities? That is always my sense. The bigger ones like Toronto, Ottawa, they have a big system, right? They have like big bureaucracies and integrity commissioners and clerks, and, and they have a lot of people, a lot, a lot of process, right? That is probably missing in some of the smaller municipalities, what, what are there, 333 in Ontario. So they're gonna be a lot different right across the board. It's actually more. It's 444. But, John, right. you, you want to pick up on that, John? Yeah, you know, David made some really good points uh, earlier, and, and they were points that were um, enunciated uh, to some large degree in a judicial inquiry report by former Associate Justice uh, uh, Morocco in the Collingwood Judicial Inquiry, where he talked about the difficulties that municipalities get in sometimes when councillor members do not understand what the role is. They are the captain of the ship. They tell the crew where they're going. The crew gets them there. That's how I always say it when I'm doing orientation sessions for council and I try to describe the roles. But Justice Morocco spent a lot of time talking about staff are there, as David indicated, neutral, impartial, uh, uh, not partisan in any way politically, to try to get council where it wants to go. But council doesn't need to go in and micromanage, doesn't need to go in and tell staff what to do. Joanne's point is in smaller municipalities, you don't have that huge amount of staff. And so therefore, council members almost feel like they can come in and start driving the ferry to the island, which is a matter that I had to investigate a couple of years ago which is completely wrong. You've got the ferry master who drives the ferry, not the council member who takes it over because he doesn't think it's going fast enough. So that's the problem, I think. Uh, council members really do not understand. And in the Collingwood Judicial Inquiry, Justice Morocco did recommend that there would be, there should be changes to the Municipal Act to recognize specifically that the role of council is not to individually instruct uh, uh, staff, the, the role of, the, individual members of council is not to instruct staff. John, just because your metaphors are so fantastic, I want to put a follow-up question to you if I can here. And that is, it does focus on the Ottawa example and Councillor Shirelli, who has gotten himself into a great deal of trouble over the last years. And apparently all council could do was dock his pay for 15 months. Do you think we need a change in procedures in Ontario whereby if somebody behaves egregiously, uh, his or her colleagues can say, you know what, we're impeaching you and we're kicking you out of your seat because you've gone beyond the pale. What's your view on that? Well, that's a really tough one because you see such terrible behavior in some municipalities that you say, hey, that should be the result. The problem with that is, uh, Steve, is that most places, uh, most uh, most assemblies do not allow their own members to kick out a fellow member because that was the, that would be the tyranny of the of the majority, right? They'd be uh, perhaps not liking the maverick views of a particular member of whether it's the council or the assembly 
assembly and all of a sudden feel that it's appropriate for them to remove them. Now, the province is looking at things like this. There was a huge consultation uh, commenced last year by the Ministry of Municipal Affairs and Housing to look at what to do with, uh, with members. Alberta passed recall legislation, not only for local members, but also for members of the Legislative Assembly and for school boards. So there are at foot, uh, at play, certain uh, initiatives to bring forward greater penalties. But your, your, your point is well taken. There's only two penalties that are authorized under the Municipal Act for a breach of a code of conduct. One is a reprimand, which is a slap on the wrist. Uh, you know, we, we don't think you're doing very well. We're going to denounce that. And the other one is a suspension of pay for up to 90 days. Of course, Rick Shirelli had six separate or five separate five. instances. So five. Uh, thank you, Joanne. There was five separate instances. So not 90 times five is 450 days, which is over a year of uh, free uh, work by this council member, which some members would say, hey, he shouldn't be there at all. I think I agree with them. I want Joanne to pick up on that, if you would. How much appetite was there on council? And we should stress, Councillor Shirelli uh, defends his innocence in all of these matters. But how much uh, appetite was there among his fellow councillors to have him thrown off council altogether, even though that wasn't an option? Uh, after the second report came out, uh, uh, the Integrity Commissioner brought it forward and a council voted on it. They immediately and unanimously passed a motion asking him to resign. Uh, Minister Stephen Clark, he is the Minister of the Municipal Affairs and Housing, personally also asked him to resign, which is unheard of. And of course, he has said no. Uh, he is still on council. He's getting his pay again uh, as of late last year. Uh, but, you know, even while he was being unpaid, he was a council. Counselor, he was collecting his pension. Um, and it is amazing. Every time I talk about this story, we've done a lot of coverage of this here at CBC. Um, I'm on the air. I get letters all the time asking, well, why is he still here? When is he leaving? And it was interesting. The public was just not aware that there's no mechanism for... Uh, removing someone from office. And uh, it's pretty interesting because there are mechanisms if you, there, you, you know, breach a financial rule. For example, there was the case of uh, Jim Carriganis in Toronto, spent too much money on his um, celebration party after the 20 elec uh, 2018 election. He broke some financing rules and he is literally no longer a counselor, but someone who has broken behavioral rules, codes of conduct to a, you know, quite shocking degree. There's really no way to remove them uh, from their elected seats. And people were shocked by that. There's, you know, a huge move in Ottawa to change the rules. David, help us understand this. Uh, we have seen examples where relationships among councillors and or with staff have gotten so bad that councils just don't meet anymore. How do municipalities make decisions when their elected fish officials don't actually meet? Yeah, that's an excellent, an excellent uh, uh, point, Steve. The reality is, though, is there needs to be a better understanding in relation to that overall that overall role. And one of the things, just going back to, again, what, what John was talking about with the provincial consultation, I did a bit of research back between 2014 and 18 in relation to where, uh, how councils were actually uh, doing in relation to holding their count, their individual councillors accountable. And the reality is, is actually councils are doing a fairly good job between 2014 and 18 of accepting integrity commissioner recommendations and actually holding those individuals ac accountable. But the reality is, is it, it's not having enough effect on those that are the, the really the most egregious cases. And uh, that's something I know that the province is looking, as John mentioned, very, uh, very concretely. But, and, and again, uh, to your question, Steve, the reputational damage that happens in relation and the paralysis that can happen to a municipality when councils are not, um, uh, you know, working effectively or individual councillors are, 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 are um, taking uh, that, piece away, it really has a, you know, a dramatic effect on both the council, the reputation, and also really the, the ability for a municipality to actually do their, do their job, which is, you know, building, growing uh, municipalities in their communities. Yeah, John, let me get you to weigh in on that, because I think we all understand that, that uh, cities and towns have a certain momentum uh, that, you know, things will happen even if councils don't meet. But... You know, if you want to build that park or you want to build that LRT or if you want to put in that social housing project, the council has to meet and decide to do it. How do those decisions get made when councils aren't meeting? 
you've got a great point there, Stephen, because you have in Ontario the open meeting rule, which means that councils have to act in an open meeting, in an, uh, a, a meeting that's open to the public. And that's the only way that they can pass bylaws. So you can effectively cripple what's happening with the municipality. There's a, there's a small municipality a little bit up north where a council member has berated all of the senior staff, so much so that the treasurer left, the CAO left, the clerk left. The clerk is a mandatory person that must attend council meetings. And everyone left. The municipality was crippled and for months could not continue its business, which is an incredibly huge problem for municipalities. Unless there's some sort of delegation bylaw, and how would you have put it in place knowing that these things were going to happen? The municipality's um, ability to go forward, as is, as David said, uh, paralyzed. And uh, the real business of municipalities, the hard decisions, the zoning bylaw or the official plan that must be enacted uh, won't uh, go ahead. The budget that must be approved. So it's 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 a real real issue. Now, one of the reasons we know what's going on in Ottawa City Hall is because Joanne Kinello is there to keep an eye on it for us, and we can you know rely on her to see what happens and then report on it, and therefore we know. We also know there are media outlets, newspapers all across Ontario that have been shutting down over the past few years, and the. The fourth estate's job as a watchdog on municipal malfeasance is therefore much, much tougher to do. Joanne, how much do you think declining media outlets is responsible for an uptick in bad behavior? Because we're just not seeing it because there's no one there to report on it. Yeah, you know, I, I can't uh, argue on the cause and effect, but uh, it is certainly... Uh true that there are fewer people covering council. You know, when you have eyes on things, people, you know, these are politicians, they want to get elected. And if uh, people know what they're doing, if they know that they're hiding things, they're not having meetings, that they are um, uh, behaving badly, that is a problem, right? And so, you know, when I started covering the Ottawa City Hall in 2010, there were more than double the number of full-time people covering it than are now. You know, right now, I know of uh, myself and my colleague, Kate Porter, our Ottawa, the Ottawa Citizen Reporter. We are the three full-time people covering City Hall for English media here. Uh, there used to be at least six people who were not just, you know, uh, coming in for that meeting, but full-time. And so they understood the rules and they understood uh, what was happening. And, you know, it was terrible. In 2014, I'll give you a quick example. It was during the election. I'm covering the Ottawa election, but there was a town east of here who said, can you please find out why the mayor is suing our city, or the, its own, the own, our own city. And I said, I really don't have time for that. But they're like, well, we don't know what's happening. And it turns out that uh, the mayor was suing them for a very good reason. A councillor on a five-member council was, um, they were refusing to allow the clerk to go ahead with a harassment complaint. You know, the, the, the complaint came forward and the report said, okay, we're going to hire an outside firm to investigate this harassment complaint by the a, a sitting councillor of a staff member, and three of the five people of council just refused to re to accept that report, and so they couldn't actually investigate this harassment. And the mayor decided, uh, you know, this is wrong, and the only way to do that is to sue my own council. Except nobody in the town knew why this was happening, hmm. and so I wrote one story. I mean, this is something that would have should have taken months and months of coverage, but this is what's happening across Ontario. Uh, especially in smaller centers where we just don't know what is happening on council. And we don't also have the reporters who have, uh, you know, some knowledge of how the rules are supposed to work. And so who knows what people are getting away with? David, I don't know if I'd make this argument, but uh, some people will make the argument that because you have, for example, a party whip in party politics at the provincial or federal level, there is at least somebody there whose job it is to make sure that people behave properly. And I guess it raises the question about whether or not bringing party politics to City Hall, which traditionally doesn't have party politics, might make a difference on this front. What do you think? Yeah, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure I would go that far, Steve. What I would uh, emphasize is the fact that, you know, the clerk of a municipality has a specific role in relation to enforcing what's called a procedural bylaw. So ultimately, the, the, um, uh, what happens at a council meeting uh, is um, is stated and how people are supposed to be able to um, uh, to act in that council meeting 
uh, the clerk is is primarily responsible for that, along with the head of council, who is ultimately, again, uh, the mayor, Reeve, or whomever, to to bring uh, decorum to that uh, to that particular proceeding. So I'm not entirely sure party politics is the uh, the solution to that. But ultimately, it is around again. We're talking about education of council, uh, of educating them in relation to what the most appropriate, um, uh, per, uh, you know, the proceed the procedural bylaw is. And how they really are supposed to be acting within that within that framework. Okay, John. One last question, and I'll put it to you. We all know we've heard this since we were kids, uh, taking civics in school, that uh, municipalities are creations of the province. They are creatures of the province. So the province ultimately uh, has a big say, and presumably has a role here. Do you know whether the province is doing much or anything to clean this up? Well, uh, yes. Uh, uh Creatures of the province, again, reiterated just uh, late last year by the Supreme Court of Canada, once again in the city of Toronto versus uh, the Attorney General of Ontario on the whole council uh, issue in the city of Toronto. Um, uh, yeah, the province is looking at it. As I indicated before, the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing had done a consultation. I had understood that changes were being proposed for late last year and we're still waiting and there's an election just around the corner. I don't think we're going to see them. You have a private member's bill that is now going to second reading uh, brought forward by a Ottawa City Councillor, a former Ottawa City Councillor who's now uh, a Liberal MP, uh, asking for greater powers, greater authority for the Integrity Commissioner to apply to the court to have someone removed, someone who's behaved egregiously badly uh, in accordance with the uh, Code of Conduct or other ethical uh, procedures or rules that the municipality has put in place. So I think the province is very mindful of this. Uh, will they have the guts to go forward with harsher uh, requirements for municipalities and their members, as Alberta did for, uh, for their elected officials? Hmm. Less than two months before a provincial election, will they have enough guts? To ask the question answers it, I suspect. Uh, <laughs> from left to right on my screen, David Arbuckle, John Mascara, and Joanne Kianalo. Really good of all of you to spend so much time with us on TVO tonight. Many thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Local governments of all sizes faced almost daily cyber threats in Ontario, and that's without the IT budgets of senior levels of government and the staffing needed for 24-7 vigilance. What's at stake and what are municipalities doing to ward off cyber crime? Let's ask. In the home of North America's most famous Shakespeare Festival, there's Dan Matheson. He's the mayor of Stratford, Ontario. In Hamilton, Ontario, Zachary Spicer, associate professor in the School of Public Policy and Administration at York University. In the Queen West area of Ontario's capital city, Sumit Bhatia, director of innovation and policy at the Rogers Cybersecure Catalyst. And in the downtown core, Judy Dizel, director of the Association of Municipalities of Ontario's Enterprise Center. Uh, TVO, incidentally, has an ongoing partnership with AMO. For the last many years, we've had a featured role at your annual general meetings, which, Judy, we look forward to this August, hopefully, in person. Can you tell us, is it going to be in person? It is going to be in person this year, Steve. Here, here. Okay. Hoping we can raise a glass of tea or something together. Let's take a look at some of the uh, notable cyber attacks across the province over the past few years. Because uh, some of this stuff happens um, sort of under the wire, and we don't necessarily hear that much about it. But in April of 2018, the town of Wasega Beach got hit. September of the same year, the town of Midland. In 2019, Mayor Matheson's own Stratford got hit. And in January of 21, the entire region of Durham was hit by a cyber attack. So, Mitch, start us off here. How common are these cyber attacks? More common than we'd like to see, Steve. Uh, you know, there's cyber attacks happening on Canadian municipalities every single day, and there's thousands of attacks that we're facing. Uh, and the number keeps going up, especially in light of uh, all of the things that we're seeing happen on a geopolitical level globally, as well as as a result of the pandemic. Zachary, how do they actually happen? Well, um, it can be as simple as uh, as a, a staff member clicking a malicious link. Um, hackers gain uh, access to a to a network and they hold it for ransom. Uh, typically, these are ransoms of between fifty and one hundred thousand um, dollars. And 
they are sort of held until until a, a municipality pays. Now, Judy, surely everybody who works for a municipality is told at some time, don't click on a link that you don't recognize where it's coming from. Yes? Absolutely, Steve. That is uh, the training that is given to municipal staff. But the reality is that these criminals are getting very, very crafty in terms of uh, their approaches to getting access to networks. And the weakest link is actually the human connection uh, within the systems. Municipalities have done some work in terms of their IT infrastructures to harden them. But it is the human piece. Uh, we want to do good service to municipal uh, to citizens within municipalities, and sometimes that results in you know uh, accidentally clicking on a link and uh, giving access to the network that you didn't intend to do. Your Worship, as we heard, you were on that list we put up just a moment ago. Can you tell us about the experience that Stratford went through? Well, it was Easter weekend, 2019, uh, coming into Easter Sunday morning, and of course our external security company noticed some activity on our servers about 5 a.m., quickly realized that they had gained uh, control over some of the servers, uh, notified our staff, and they, of course, came in on a long holiday weekend to make sure they shut down the system to try to uh, stop them from gaining widespread access to all of our systems. And then the methodical, long, and deliberate process of understanding where they got in and how they got in and how to resecure the network uh, started to take place. But at the same time, we still had to worry about ongoing operations, ensuring our emergency management services were up, our water and wastewater facilities could still run. And then what do you do with uh, the employees who are going to come to work on Monday who are used to having technology as the backbone to how they provide service and not being able to access it? Well, let me do a bunch of follow-ups here. Did you ever get to the bottom of how they got in? Yes, it was through a, an appliance, a third-party uh, software. Uh, that uh, rides in the city system that we use for certain aspects of our operations. Uh, it had been in our system for some time, and they had chosen at the deliberate and right time that they wanted to activate it and to take control over the system. And uh, it's one of those things where you look and you wonder how many other vulnerabilities, uh, because you have so much software that rides in your system, uh, are out there, and then also how many other communities is that same software sitting on the servers of and are just waiting to do the exact same thing again. And how long did it take to fix it? Well, we were without uh, our computer servers for almost uh, 12 days, which was lightning fast in this business. Uh, we had a really good partner in Deloitte and our cyber security, or sorry, cyber security, but also our insurer and our own IT staff. But it was tough for 12 days, of course, working through the process, taking servers offline, scrubbing them, checking all devices, hardware, and then bringing them back online. And today, you know, we have a very robust uh, education campaign for our employees uh, with regard to phishing and, and penetration tests. Do you know what the cyber criminals actually wanted to do to Stratford? They just wanted money, Steve. All they really wanted was a, a Bitcoin ransom, uh, which of course the city paid, and we were caught in a situation. Once you have cyber uh, insurance, your insurance company takes over some of the decisions for you, and they were insistent that based on the amount of money that it would cost to pay the uh, ransomware, that it was far better to do that and then it was to just let them keep it and, of course, uh, rebuild databases. Uh, that was against the advice, of course, of the Ontario Provincial Police Cyber Crime Unit, the RCMP uh, Crime Unit. They, they don't like you to pay. They'd like you to kind of uh, leave them out on the ledge. Uh, there's also the obligation municipalities have and, of course, elected councils and administration of what information do they have do they have access to and what's our fiduciary duty and legislative responsibility to ensure that it's protected? Well, let me get where everybody else is on that issue of whether to pay or not to pay. Submit, what's your advice on that? I think that debate continues in the industry and I think we're probably going to see, at least in the short term, Steve, a case-by-case -case evaluation of whether to pay or not to pay. Uh, there are organizations that have the luxury and the resources and I'd say also the influence to be able to take a stand and say we will not pay. Uh, but we know that there's a lot of small, medium businesses, there are a lot of smaller municipalities that are affected where getting back to the order of operations is a priority. And in those cases, uh, we do have to evaluate whether or not payment uh, would be the quickest, easiest uh, way for them to get back to uh, running operations. So at this point, I think the debate's going to continue for a while. Zachary, what's your view on that? 
Well, I mean, I think it's important to to uh, recognize as well that paying doesn't guarantee that you're going to get your systems back. In some cases, we have seen municipalities pay, and um, and then they ask they're they're asked to pay more, ten thousand dollars more, twenty thousand dollars more, additional Bitcoin, um, and then of course it it encourages others. So I think. Um, Municipalities are in a very uh, tricky position because um, it, there's no guarantee that you'll get your systems back. But at the same time, that's usually the the, the quickest way to get your systems back. Municipalities are also under tremendous pressure to get back to normal operations, right? Um, and of course, once the public finds out, uh, people are going to be obviously anxious about the potential vulnerability of of, of the information that, that they've given the government. Hmm. Judy, do you have... Uniform advice that you give to all of Ontario's 444 municipalities on this front? So in 2020, we did release a, a cybersecurity toolkit for municipalities, and it reflects exactly what the mayor said in terms of the OPP advice and not paying for ransom. Um, you know, there is an incentive, obviously, to uh, criminals by paying that ransom to continue these kinds of attacks. And it also doesn't guarantee, as mentioned, your data getting back to you. Having said that, uh, the city of Atlanta was attacked in 2018, and they chose not to pay the 55 thousand dollars in Bitcoin that was asked in the ransom and instead decided to rebuild their systems. The last time I checked, they were in about $17 million in terms of rebuilding their system after that ransomware attack. Each municipality has to look at the individual scenario they're caught in in terms of the event, weigh the pros and cons, and make the decision as to whether or not, in fact, they are going to pay the ransom or if, in fact, they're just going to rebuild their systems. But the only thing I would really emphasize and really is important is we've got to recognize that these are crimes and that municipalities need to report these crimes either to the OPP, their local enforcement, or the RCMP because uh, even though it's hard to track these criminals down, there still needs to be some uh, tracking of it in some way in terms of uh, police activity and monitoring. Sumit, let me get your view on that, on what transpired in Atlanta, because I, I guess it takes a lot of political guts to say to taxpayers, we're going to spend $17 million dollars to avoid giving $55,000 to a bunch of cyber terrorists. Uh, what do you think of their decision? I think, uh, again, uh, Steve, I think the decision is going to lie based on their priorities and, and the current state of their infrastructure. Uh, I think, uh, you know, we know that resources do are not equivalent across all municipalities. I can uh, speak for Canada, at least between large cities, smaller municipalities, we can see that differential existing, uh, which means that they haven't built the infrastructure and the backup system and the resources to bring their systems back online and rebuild them. Uh, in this particular case, Lanta made a choice. I think uh, they probably determined that choice was the right one for them. Maybe not financially, but from the perspective of setting some baselines around how they're going to approach these situations, I think it was probably a wise decision. Mayor Matheson, did you consider that decision, saying to hell with them and we're going to just build a new system? Well, as I said, you know, when you sit with site, your cyber insurers, uh, they immediately send in uh, expert help. In this case, it was Deloitte. Uh, they make the decision with you. Now, of course, council at the end of the day could have said, no, we're going to we're gonna hold up and, and not pay. But then you sit there, you've paid for cyber insurance. The insurer will then say to you, we're not covering X, Y, and Z. You can now pay for it out of the municipal tax taxation base, which is already pushed to the limit on many, many aspects of providing service. And why did you get the insurance in the first place? So we went along with the advice of our insurer to ensure that we stayed in compliance with our policy and to ensure that our taxpayers had the coverage that we had originally paid for. Do you yet know who did this? I mean, I know you've got a contact that you had to send a Bitcoin to, but do you act, does anybody actually know who was responsible for it? As I understand it, the RCMP and the OPP are, are quite well aware of the uh, actors involved. Uh, an, ex an expression they used and. It's quite funny. They said, uh, we know these guys. They're, they're good criminals. But they said they deliver. They'll deliver if you pay the ransom. And we think you should do it. The other piece about this is it's not that we interact with the ransom holder or our IT staff does. The outside consultant of Deloitte uh, that was brought in by our insurer, Deloitte, uh, they actually were the ones that interacted with them. And they have somebody who specializes in the dark web in dealing with these, these individuals. So they have some kind of rapport between them if you can believe it, 
at their level because they're uh, they're like the roadrunner and the coyote. They meet up regularly to talk about these things. <laughs> That's a nice analogy. Tell me, did you... I'm not trying to suggest here that you're antediluvian or something like that, but let's face it, most people in this country don't know where to buy Bitcoin. Did you know where to buy Bitcoin to take care of these guys? Not at all. What had what actually happened was when it came time to buy the Bitcoin, that's where the consultant comes in. They know exactly where to buy it. They know how they're going to buy it. They know how they're going to transact on the dark web. They know the sequence of events that have to happen to do so. And it's not as simple as they said on the Sunday they want the money and on Monday you're giving it. It takes days to set up. Uh, there's a whole process to make sure that the uh, first amount of coin goes in, that the encryption keys are given. They're then put on the server to make sure what they said they were going to do does occur. And then there's a transaction that takes place for the next bit, another set of encryption keys. And there's a whole process that was put in place, which I guess is negotiated uh, between the consultants, security consultants that are hired by municipalities, businesses, and of course, their insurers, and of course, the people on the other side, the terrorists slash criminals. Uh, submit the, the example of Atlanta, $17 million. That's a lot of money. Uh, the Stratford example, $55,000 of Bitcoin is a lot less money. I'd like to know um, from your experience, what's the most egregious amount you can recall having been paid, uh, let's say in Canada, uh, to get rid of a cyber threat? I, you got me there, Steve. I think, uh, you know, in Canada, the numbers have been relatively low. On a North American level, I've heard numbers up to about $2.5 million, uh, but I wouldn't be able to give you an exact answer for Canadian um, but I think what we've seen typically is $50,000 to about $500,000 seems to be an average within which uh, a lot of these organizations are operating when they make their requests. And do you know, I mean, fair enough on the money amount, but do you, do you know what the sort of most egregious or worst example of an attempted threat was? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, one of the threats that comes to mind is one that had happened in New Brunswick. In fact, I think uh, St. John's, uh, in New Brunswick, and they were forced to shut down all municipal services following a severe breach. Uh, now, we've heard lots of these things, but in this particular case, St. John, I believe, had refused to pay the ransom demands and also elected not to immediately reveal the details of that attack uh, and went ahead and completely rebuilt its systems, uh, which means that you had to change everything from how you communicate with the outside world to how you deliver services. That's a massive undertaking, and that's one that comes to mind right now, as you ask that. And how did that eventually resolve itself? I believe they did manage to get through. Now it takes a, you know, there's a lot of interesting uh, learnings as we go through this experience, right from how do we communicate with our uh, partners to communicating with our vendors to communicating with citizens. And at the same time, how do we start to now integrate our systems to work with much larger networks that we are part of. So uh, I think part of this is the learning that comes and follows months, years after, and then how that learning is shared with a much larger ecosystem System so that we can all benefit from it. Judy, I guess one of the concerns is that nowadays, you know, pretty much everything we rely on our municipalities for is digital, uh, whether it's electricity or water service or whatever. So tell me, what is the, what is the concern you have that if these things don't get resolved appropriately, uh, if a threat is acted upon, what are you concerned would take place? Well, as you know, Steve, uh, municipalities are responsible for a lot of services that their citizens rely on, from uh, road networks uh, through to water systems, wastewater systems. And many of these uh, monitoring systems are now connected to the internet and subject to potential threats as a result. And, you know, if there is an example uh, potentially of a, a cyber attack, it could threaten the water quality that you have. It could threaten a number of things in terms of that. We've seen that in the US. Uh, there was a water system that was attacked and it did threaten the water quality, which in turn obviously could also threaten the public health. And so these are the kinds of things that really concern me about this. And this is where uh, we really want to focus our energy in terms of uh, municipalities thinking about their IT infrastructure, because it's not just your computer system anymore. It's anything now that a service provides that is connected to the internet. We've got to think broadly and we've got to think about how we are going to 
to maintain current software standards for those, how we're going to protect against criminal uh, activity within those systems, and also we're going to need to develop business continuity plans in the event of attacks. And those are the kinds of things that we are working on right now with municipalities. Zachary, could you pick up on that? What would be your most uh, sort of uh, scariest concern of happening to a municipality if some cyber threats were actually acted upon? So for me, um, it's uh, it, it's really about the the threat to critical infrastructure. So I, I share a lot of the same the same concerns as Judy, and she mentioned um, the the case in Florida. That was Old Mayor Florida, where where the cyber criminals actually slowly increased the 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 amount of so of uh, sodium hydroxide within the water supply, right to to the point where it was really reaching dangerous levels. So um, it's it's things like that that um, that really scare me. But with that said. Even um, you know, a kind of run-of-the-mill cyber attack could critically disrupt the operations of any municipal government and and prevent them from from servicing residents over over the period of two weeks or months or anything like that. So these can be incredibly disruptive. But I think the 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 severe threat to critical infrastructure is is the thing thing that really really worries me. Let me follow up with you on that, Zachary, because just as we try to imagine what potential havoc can be caused. I mean, presumably, they could knock out all the street lights. I mean, the, the traffic signals. I mean, that would really cause a lot of havoc. Or presumably, you could also erase the, uh, the tax rolls in the city, and you wouldn't know who'd pay their taxes and who hadn't. Are those the kinds of things that municipalities worry about? Absolutely. I mean, uh, more and more infrastructure at the local level has digital com digital components to it. I mean, we have sensors in in our roads, our traffic lights are are, ge are generally controlled digitally. I mean, you could uh, knock out every single traffic light. You could raise bridges and not put them back down. You could erase tax records. You could release sensitive payment information from from people who were. Uh, you know, paying for recreation programs or anything like that. I mean, the thing is that um, the majority of services that Canadians receive are coming from local governments. And so we think about everything that we use on, on a day-to-day -day basis that is delivered locally not being available, right? Water potentially, right? I mean, we're, we're, we're talking about really disruptive changes that, that could be happening. Your Worship, that's a pretty scary list that Zachary just gave, but what was on your list when you knew that Stratford had been hit? Well, you right away go through all the privacy legislation and all the data that sits on your server, whether it is uh, banking information, how the recreation programs, your Ontario Works database, your public housing database, uh, all those types of listings. Um, we're required to, of course, separate them and ensure that they're protected at all times. And that was one of the first things we wanted to do is make sure that any data that we were holding like that was protected and safe because that was one of the things we communicated, not only to our staff, but the public, that the information uh, did not include personal or private information. Uh, and that gave some relief to people. There's still the skepticism that goes with it where they're kind of the show me I'm from Missouri State idea where they wanna know how do, how do you know that for sure? And you just have to keep following up on it. You know, one of the things that strikes me the most about this though, is that every municipality is, is being tasked to do more with less, to become more efficient in providing services. And everybody wants to move to that online ability to transact, to buy service, to do things. And with it comes, of course, an increased amount of traffic on the internet, and of course, through systems that are prevalent throughout municipal government. But it also then requires that there's the consumer amount of money spent on security. So the efficiency that's gained, that people think you gain from necessarily moving to online services, it actually takes some of those savings and they have to be diverted into better IT systems and higher security levels to ensure that you can continue to operate those services. And I think that's one of the things that so many municipalities are learning now, that the savings just don't fall to the bottom line, don't allow you to reduce taxes, don't allow you to allocate to some other area because the IT infrastructure now needs to be seen as foundational to the operation of the entire community. If you don't have strong IT and strong IT services and security, you can't provide the basic services anymore. Well, I was just going to say, Judy, we're not going to go back to the day where everybody trudges down to City Hall with a, with a check and pays their water bill in person. I mean, most municipalities couldn't handle that if that were to happen. So the alternative is to try to be as invulnerable as possible to any cyber mischief. How close to that do you think municipalities across Ontario are? 
So the, the pandemic has really hastened the pace of digital government. Uh, citizens are absolutely asking for more access to digital thing, uh, services. And that that is something that municipalities need to respond to. But the mayor is absolutely right. Uh, you know, this is something that is relatively new. IT infrastructure is now just as critical as your road network or your water system. And there's some work that needs to be done by municipalities in terms of strengthening that IT infrastructure to be able to provide those services. In terms of protecting, you know, there's no guarantee that anything you can do was going to give you 100% protection. Criminals are very motivated to access your systems. And so it, the point I made earlier about training the humans is really important because uh, that is, in fact, the weakest link. It's really we need to focus on training people to recognize uh, potential phishing attacks through email uh, so that they don't open up the system to vulnerability. Uh, you know, you can do all kinds of things in terms of encryption of data, uh, multi-factor authentication, backups that are held off site, all of those good best practices in terms of IT that we really do need to focus on the humans and training them how to protect themselves personally from cybercrime. Because once you train them how to do it personally, they're going to bring it to work as well. Sumit, let me get your take on this. I, I guess it is the case that every time a municipality thinks that it has closed one door in terms of protecting itself, the criminals have figured out how to open another door. How, how you know, I guess who's winning the race is what I really want to know. Uh, you know, we've heard this before, Steve. They just need to win once. We need to win every single time. So in that sense, the race is a much longer race for us. We're, uh, we're sprinting and marathoning all at the same time. And that's just, unfortunately, the, uh, the way our, our municipalities are currently uh, resourced. Uh, you know, municipalities are often dealing with maintaining cyber risk and resilience for some of the most important civic services and critical infrastructure that keep our communities operational and safe. That's a pretty large attack surface for a lot of uh, cyber criminals to try and exploit. And uh, they recognize the vulnerability of this sector and they're looking to exploit them both for monetary gains and social political instability and sometimes share mischief. So the game looks very different from their perspective than ours. And at, at this point, we've got a, quite a road ahead of us. In which case, Zachary, is this a case of not whether a municipality is going to be hit, but when a municipality is going to be hit? Um, it's in in a way it is, and I think that um, that municipalities need to uh, plan for this in a much more deliberate way than they have in the past. Is that municipalities have sort of tended to look at uh, failures in in certain infrastructure um, as a given, right? That we know that we're that that we're that we're going to see potholes every single spring. It's going to happen, right? So planning for potholes is something that that municipalities do right um, a cyber attack is something that may happen the potholes are guaranteed so it requires a bit of a of a change in mentality i think you've obviously been driving on eglinton avenue just north of our studio <laughs> to, when you talk about potholes because oh my goodness there are body shops all over the city that are getting rich off drivers who are going past there anyway that's uh, off the path let me get back on the path here mayor matheson before the cyber attack hit stratford how big was your it department our IT department was six individuals. Uh, you know, we've we've since grown it uh, from there. We've uh, increased the amount of spend we have on uh, IT security. We have made it more foundational to what we do. But there is an opportunity here for the senior levels of government to play a role in this. As you've alluded to, there's 444 municipalities in this province. Over 300 of them are small in nature, townships and small rural municipalities. There is a role for the government to play in helping create a provincial standard or a national standard with regard to cybersecurity and sharing some of those systems. We need to make sure that the disparate parts uh, of the municipal sector come together under one umbrella. You, you know, you look in small uh, municipalities, sometimes the person in charge of IT infrastructure is also the person that collects the tax money and works the counter on Monday, Wednesday and Thursday afternoon. And somehow we need to make sure that we give those smaller municipalities just as much support as we would look to in the large urban centers. And I think there's an opportunity for us to collectively buy together, create standards, to share information. Uh, they're already doing it at Ryerson on the cyber security unit sharing risks and, and best practices. They're doing it at AMO. And I think that these things can continue to go on into a provincial level and almost a national level here so that Canada can be a secure nation for its municipalities and government IT infrastructure.
Judy, I should get you to follow up on that because I have no doubt that cities like Toronto and Ottawa spend tens <clears> of millions a year to keep their system safe, but there are lots of small municipalities, as the mayor says, where they can't afford that. What do they do? And he's absolutely right. He stole one of my standard lines that I use every time I introduce uh, municipalities in Ontario. Uh, you know, there's 270 with less than 10,000 population. Their average FTE count is five. They've got small staff counts uh, dealing with multiple services requirements they already have. They have, and IT is not one of them necessarily. And in those cases, they often rely on either an external uh, consultant to manage their IT infrastructure, or they uh, work within a shared services model. There are some counties within Southern Ontario that offer IT to their area municipalities, for example. So these are the kinds of things that municipalities are doing to beef up their IT infrastructure because they just don't have the staff to do it locally. We are also working on uh, helping them build that. Part of my job actually is to identify gaps in markets for municipalities and ways to extend the capacity of municipalities and also uh, perhaps do some aggregation to lower the cost or provide better value. And so we're absolutely looking at that at AMO in terms of ways that we can help municipalities on the cyber side. It's also around cyber insurance. Uh, the mayor spoke extensively about how they relied on their insurance provider when they were attacked. The reality is that cyber insurance is quickly becoming a dinosaur. It's a losing proposition for insurance companies. They are not uh, offering insurance for cyber anymore to a lot of uh, places. If you get it, feel grateful for it, but I suspect that within the next couple of years, it'll be completely gone. And that's an area that we're looking at because gone with that cyber insurance is that cyber response team that the mayor uh, and his council relied on when they were attacked. Uh, small municipalities don't have those cyber response teams on their own. And so we need to figure out how to provide that kind of service in the event of attack. That feels like a good place to leave this thing. I want to thank the four of you for coming on to TVO tonight and sharing your views on this. Zachary Spicer from York University, Dan Matheson, the mayor of Stratford. In the lower left-hand column, Sumit Bhatia from the Rogers Cyber Secure Catalyst System and Judy Dizel from the Association of Municipalities of Ontario, all 444 of them. Talk about a target. All right, thanks everybody. Be well out there. And that is the agenda for Monday, April 4th, 2022. Tomorrow, what wastewater signals are telling us about a sixth wave of COVID-19 here in Ontario? I'm Steve Pagan. Thanks for watching TVO, for joining us online at tvo.org, and we'll see you again tomorrow. The Agenda with Steve Pagan is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.